The ocean covers 70% of the globe. It gives us oxygen and food and millions of jobs. It brings joy and shapes our climate and weather. The ocean is life and it belongs to everyone. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is the world's independent leader in ocean discovery, exploration, and education, working to understand and sustain one of humanity's most precious common resources. Join us today for our ocean, our planet, and our future. Welcome to the Ocean Encounters virtual series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, as we like to call it. Tonight's Ocean Encounters discussion is Corals in Crisis, How Scientists Are Racing to Stop a Deadly Disease. These online events are made possible through the generous support of the Avatar Alliance Foundation. My name is Veronique LaCapra. I'll be your HUI host for this evening. Before I introduce our panelists, let's take a minute and find out where all of you are tuning in from. If you have joined us on Zoom, you should see a pop-up poll on your screen asking you to indicate the region where you live. Hui, as you may know, is on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, so uh, we expect that quite a few people will be from the Northeastern US, but if you're from somewhere else, please let us know. The poll choices don't cover everywhere, but pick the one that's closest to where you are. While the poll's running, here's some tips on how you can optimize your Zoom event experience with us. Our panelists will be taking questions from all of you throughout the evening. If you'd like to participate in this live Q&A, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type your question in the window that appears. You might be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, uh, but please use the Q&A button instead. We often get literally hundreds of questions. So if we don't get to yours while we're live, our goal will be to post answer answers to as many of them as we can following the program. You can ask questions anytime starting now. I also wanna let you know that we are recording this event and that recording will be made available on the hui.edu website. And we've got our results from the poll. As expected, about half of you are from the Eastern US, but we've got uh, quite a good spread tonight uh, across the United States, 14% from the Western US, for example, and quite a good showing from overseas as, oh, this is great, 10% from the Caribbean, which is terrific uh, because that's gonna be one of the focuses of our evening, so wonderful. All right, let's get started with the main event. Worldwide, Corals are struggling to survive, decimated by pollution, destructive fishing practices, and climate change. Six years ago, a deadly coral disease outbreak started in Florida and has now made its way to corals in the U.S. Virgin Islands, killing corals at an unprecedented rate. But there is hope. Tonight, we have with us three scientists who are working to understand and find solutions to the threats facing coral reefs and the spectacular ecosystems they support. Our special guest is renowned marine biologist, ocean explorer, and conservationist, Sylvia Earle. She's joined by coral disease ecologist, Marilyn Brandt from the University of the Virgin Islands, and marine microbial ecologist, Amy April from Hui. Thank you, Sylvia, Marie, uh, Marilyn, and Amy for joining us this evening to talk about your work to understand and sustain corals. And thank you also to everyone who tuned in to join us. So we're gonna have a pretty serious conversation this evening, but before we go there um, to talk about the threats facing coral reefs, I'd like for our viewers to be able to get a little bit of a sense of each of you by having you share one really memorable, positive experience that you've had on a coral reef. Sylvia, why don't you get us started? <laughs> well, I think my role here is as a witness to remarkable change over a number of decades. I first began exploring the ocean as a would-be scientist in the 1950s in the Florida Keys and later in the Caribbean. And I've seen more learned about coral reefs since that time than perhaps during all preceding history, but at the same time, I've seen tremendous loss. As far as an experience, I'd like to take everybody underwater and this took place a few years ago off the coast of Veracruz. I could see the city lights of this 
big city in Mexico. And you would think there wouldn't be any live corals so close to a big city, but huh, there was a spawning event. It happens once a year, uh, literally about 9.15, <laughs> a few days after the last full moon of summer. And it was such a glorious, uplifting experience to see, uh, what can I say? Um, it was like heaven on earth. All heaven broke loose. <laughs> It's incredible. It was, I've never seen anything like that. No, um, it wasn't just the, the corals, uh, a lot of the other creatures, it's sort of a, a mass spawning event of oh, little polychaete worms, some of the brittle stars. And at the surface, it was like a floating nursery that one would hope would go and repopulate an area where it had been depleted of its corals or renew what's right there. Anyway, it was really exciting. Wonderful. Marilyn, how about you? Any great memories of a coral reef? Oh yeah, tons. It's hard to choose. Um, one in particular is actually one of the first times I did diving here in the Virgin Islands. And um, we, we went out to a reef site that's pretty far offshore and we did a, a pretty deep dive down to about 130 feet. Um, and I've been told that there were reefs down there, there were scientists here already studying them um, and that they were spectacular reefs. And when I got down there, you know, it was, it was incredible. There was just so much coral and all the corals were really flat because it's, it's deeper. So the corals kind of get flat to, take, to try to capture the light more. But if, as you looked under the corals, um, you could find all the fish and creatures that turns out the corals were just kind of like pedestals. Uh, and it was just such an incredible dive, so much diversity, so much life, and really inspiring. Oh, that sounds amazing. And Amy, last but not least. Oh, I've had a lot of memorable experiences underwater. Um, and I spend most of my time studying the corals, and I rarely pay attention to the fish. And uh, a couple of months ago, when I was in St. Thomas working with Marilyn, I had this uh, double-headed wrasse about this big located me, you know, five minutes into the dive and just stuck with me like right in my personal space that entire dive. So I could not ignore that fish. And um, it was almost like a little pet. And uh, so then we went up to the boat and had lunch an hour later came down on that same reef. And guess what? There he was waiting for me, followed me around that entire dive too. So I could not ignore the fish on that dive. What do you think he was attracted to? Was it something you were wearing or what? We were taking like coral samples and so I think that just intrigued him um, and so either that or maybe there was something funky about my wetsuit smell. I mean, who knows? <laughs> All right. Okay, now for some more serious topics. Um, Sylvia, you have, you began exploring, as you said, and studying coral reefs as a scientist starting in the 1950s and you've seen corals all over the world. Just in the past year, uh, I know you've dived in coral reefs in the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, the Azores, the Galapagos Islands, Indonesia, and most recently in the Seychelles. What changes have you seen over the past almost 70 years? Well, there's good news and there's not so good news. The not so good news is that many of the reefs are like ghost towns. The fish are basically... Uh, they're not there. You used to see groupers in particular, but because groupers taste good to people, uh, we've eliminated them almost everywhere throughout their range. And part of the reason is, like the little rats that you, you uh, described, they're curious. They'll follow you around. They, they're <laughs> they are vulnerable to anything that looks like food, whether it's on a hook or you know, they're, they, they, they get into fish traps anyway. So sharks are also among the missing. And coral reefs need the fish. Fish need the coral reefs, but coral reefs also need the fish. And it's really disturbing to go to where you live, Marilyn, in the Virgin Islands and see parrotfish on the menu. When I began diving many years ago, nobody ate parrotfish. I mean, nobody. There, there are plenty of other fish and they aren't the first choice of anybody, but they become kind of the, the last one standing and they're, they're also pretty easy to catch. They don't go for a hook because they're grazers, but 
Otherwise, if you dive, you can spear them or using a net. Of course, that is not good for the reefs either, but they're increasingly rare, especially the big ones. So oh, the good news is that in places that have been protected, where people proactively say, we're not going to fish here, we're going to give fish a break. They, if, as long as they haven't taken the last grouper, <laughs> as long as there are a few lobsters somewhere, there's a chance that recovery can take place. And we've seen it happen. We've seen it happen on both sides of, of Mexico. We've seen it happen in the Florida Keys. If originally the fishermen were kind of opposed to the idea, but having even small areas makes a big difference and big areas make a much bigger difference. We need to think, we need to scale up if we're serious about protecting and restoring health to coral reefs. Sylvia, you talked about um, fishing as a threat. Are there other threats to coral reefs that we should know about? Well, climate change is a big headline. We first began noticing bleaching around 1980. I mean, there'd been some before, but that's when it began to scale up. So climate change, warming, which brings along also acidification, excess carbon dioxide becoming carbonic acid. And that affects not just corals with their stony matrix, but a lot of other things. And in fact, it probably has an effect across the board. You're changing the chemistry of the ocean, starting with the little guys who are most vulnerable, the plankton, but even large substantial systems like the coral, the corals I can see behind your head. <laughs> They're vulnerable if it, if it becomes, I mean, there's, the other thing of course is, is what else we're putting in the ocean, changing the chemistry, but also the destruction from the, the mechanical action of destruction through fishing, whether it's discarded nets, or plastic bags that get wrapped around the coral and smother coral. Uh, the first time I went to the Red Sea, there were no plastics. But when I went back in 1990, oh, it was big garbage bags were all wrapped around the, the corals. And well, <laughs> I saw so many bottles, and no bottles before when I'd been there before, but they look like jellyfish. There were so many of them sort of swept along in, in places gathered together by the currents. Anyway, we know what the problems are. And the reason I am a confirmed optimist is knowing that we've got the problems, we know what to do. We just have to do it. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about a new problem tonight um, that Amy and Marilyn, you've been studying, um, and it's a coral disease that has had particularly devastating impacts on reefs here in the US. Amy, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. The disease affects stony corals, and these are the corals that build the reef framework. So they're calcifying and, and forming that reef for all of that life. Um, the name of the disease is stony coral tissue loss disease, and as the name suggests, it does cause corals to lose their tissue. Here's a picture of a coral that's affected by this disease. The disease lesion where the, the coral is, tissue is newly lost is that white band. Um, and so that white band of disease travels across the colony. So the colorful brown um, tissue of the coral, that, that's still alive, that's still healthy tissue. And then what's kind of a greenish yellowish color there um, has already been impacted by the disease. That's dead coral skeleton you'll see. Um, so this is affecting many corals in the Caribbean, um, up to about almost two dozen species, which is one of the reasons that it's really problematic. So here's a, uh, some photographs just showing some of these corals that are affected by this disease. Um, this includes many of our large reef building corals, as well as some that were already um, endangered or threatened before this disease even started. Other reasons that this disease is problematic is that it can spread really rapidly over a reef and between reefs. So we think the vector is either waterborne um, or some kind of a, a mechanism, a vector that can travel between reefs. Um, so it can leave entire um, reefs devastated in, in over weeks to months, depending on the severity. Uh, and lastly, the, the disease kills corals. I mean, so the affected tissue 
does not recover. Um, and so that's a, a coral colony that, that's not able to, to live and, and recover. So unfortunately, it's not, it's not good news for reefs. Um, it was first reported in 2014, just um, near Miami. And since then it spread throughout the Florida reef track. That's what you're seeing here. It's just a, a map showing that disease spread over time. Um, and it's now present in the lower Florida Keys near Key West. Unfortunately, the disease did not restrict itself just to Florida. And over the past two years, we've seen this disease spread throughout the Caribbean. So here's a map showing the latest from about um, a week and a half ago of where the disease has been detected. So from Mexico, Belize, Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, Puerto Rico, and even the US Virgin Islands, which are the reefs just in Maryland's backyard. Right, so before we uh, hone in on the US Virgin Islands, I just wanna clarify one thing you said, Amy, you talked about uh, the possible vectors of, of how this disease is spreading and you, you, you think it has to do with the currents, is that what you said? Yeah, we don't actually know the, 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 what's causing it and also how it's being spread. And so it's not going along the prevailing currents. Um, and so one idea is that it's being transmitted somehow by, um, by other mechanisms such as, as ships or even divers. Um, so I know that was what, one of the latest hypotheses about the spread um, to the British Virgin Islands. Um, which was a popular dive site that it was detect first detected at. Mm. Interesting. So Marilyn, when was stony coral tissue loss disease first observed in the, in the Virgin Islands, US Virgin Islands? Yeah, so um, it was first, it, it first appeared about a little over a year ago here. Um, I think we have a, a map that's gonna show just some geographic context of where I am. Um, in, the, in the Caribbean. So the United States Virgin Islands, we're, we are a US territory. We're located in the Northeastern Caribbean, pretty much right between Puerto Rico and the British Virgin Islands. Um, there's three main islands that are part of the US Virgin Islands. So mm -hmm. St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix, um, and several offshore keys. Um, so I'm, I live on St. Thomas, and that's where um, also one of the main campuses of the University of the Virgin Islands, which I work for, is located. Um, so back to the disease, it was first, we first noticed it in late January of 2019. Actually our dive um, program officer, um, director of the dive program, he saw something really odd at a reef called Flat Key, uh, which is off the south coast of St. Thomas near an offshore key. Um, and so I was actually going out with my crew the next day and we decided to stop there not really expecting to see anything different. I had heard about the disease in Florida. Obviously I, I study coral disease, so I was up on the details. Um, but when I got in the water there, my stomach just completely dropped. Um, I, I have, like I mentioned, I've studied coral disease for my career and I knew exactly, or I knew that something devastating was happening. So I think we have a, a video showing um, that actual, that first dive that I did. So when I got in the water, you know, a coral reef has a lot of different colors on it, lots of different browns and greens and reds and all different kinds of colors. But on this reef, there was a lot of white. And we had just been at this reef the month before and had not seen anything. And in this video, you can see there's just these bright white patches on these corals. And that's, as Amy described, those are parts of the corals that have basically liquefied and the, the living coral tissue has come off of the coral. So what was shocking to me was the sheer number of corals that were affected. But as I looked around more on that dive, I also realized that there were certain types of corals that were affected. And that was uh, an indicator to me that this was stony coral tissue loss disease that had been described from Florida and it had really all of the matching characteristics. Um, so this dive was devastating to me because I, knew what it meant. And um, when I came up from the dive, you know, the first thing I did was contact um, the, the Coral Reef Initiative Coordinator for the territory to just start um, figuring out what we could do about it. Um, this, I also, you know, sat and cried a little bit because I knew what this meant for my, uh, my son who's six who 
has not been diving on a reef, but really wants to go diving on a reef. And I knew that this was going to change everything. Well, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit more about that disease, Marilyn, but you mentioned your son. And, and I'd like to pause and take a moment uh, to take our first audience question. But before I do that, um, I just want to say that I'm thrilled that we have three women oceanographers with us here tonight. And I know you, all three of you are mothers. And I'm curious, do you have any special ways that you use to stay connected to your families and your children when you're away working or at sea? Uh, Amy, I see you nodding. <laughs> Go ahead. Absolutely. So um, I keep this little plastic Tyrannosaurus Rex dinosaur in my in the pocket of my uh, BC. It's the jacket I wear when I go diving. And so anytime I, I'm diving, especially the last um, few minutes of a dive when we're, hopefully their work is wrapped up, I pull him out and I take a, a picture of him on the reef and um, initially, he was just really bright and front and center and easy to find. And then I realized, you know, as my kids were getting older, I needed to hide this thing a little bit better. And so, um, so now that's always the challenge to get him in the right place. So see if you can find him there in that photo. He's, uh, he's definitely a little more hidden. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And so, so basically we, we do this and it's a way for me to send the photos home at the end of the day and stay connected to, to my kids. Um, and, and then I always take the dinosaur back, you know, never leave any, any plastic <laughs> underwater. He, he lives in my BC pocket and then he's just ready for the next adventure. That's great. Uh, Marilyn or Sylvia? Go ahead, Marilyn. Okay, well, um, I actually, you know, I don't, I'm lucky to have basically my laboratory in my backyard here. So I don't actually do too much traveling for work. So, but science never stops. And on the weekends, sometimes we have to go out and do surveys or do you know experiments or something and get in the water. And so a lot of times my kids will come with me. Um, my husband's also a marine biologist and that's been really helpful to have such support. And he'll come too and the kids have a great time, uh, you know, swimming around, snorkeling. I think my son, who's six, learned to swim when he was basically three, and my daughter, who's almost three, is really close. So um, I just take him with me <laughs> and tell him what's going on. <laughs> That's great to be able to do that. Um, yeah. Sylvia, do you? Yeah, likewise. When possible, I just scoop him up. Or Now I have grandchildren and do the same thing. <laughs> let's go splash around in the ocean. <laughs> and when people ask, what can I do to make a difference for the ocean? I, first thing I, I say is take a kid out and go get wet. And if you don't have a kid of your own, borrow one. But whatever it takes, look at the ocean through their eyes because it really does make a difference to see, you know, to see as you said, look at the future. What's it going to be? Well, speaking of the future, we have a question here from Marina, who's joining us from Denmark and would like to know, uh, this is to you, Sylvia, if you were a new college graduate right now, um, how would you go about pursuing your career? And also to Mar Marilyn and Amy, what advice do you have for a new graduate? Dive in, go get wet. I tell everybody that, whether you're a student or not, it, it really helps, I mean, images today, uh, convey so much that we nobody could convey before, especially in deep areas. Uh, the existence of these deep corals that are are tricky to get to. You need a submarine to get to some of them that are like a thousand feet down. They're not the ones that have the photosynthetic algae in the tissues, but they're certainly corals. And the more we go forward, we, we have better access to the deep sea. And so I would just say, what makes, what aspect really makes your heart beat fast? What, what piece of it do you really find appealing? I mean, look, we're with a couple of individuals who've looked at, at Carl's in trouble and trying to solve those problems. It's like a, a, C, a CSI for, for the ocean. Um, the, the, it, there's, it doesn't have to be science, but it, 
there's so much in science. I mean, it could be poetry or art or music or whatever. The ocean is there for everybody. And don't let anybody tell you you can't do it, whether it's because you're a girl <laughs> or because you're too young or you're too old or you're too this or you're too that, you're too tall, you're too short. No, just if, if it's what you really want to do, don't get discouraged. Just keep peeling back the layers of those who say no and make it a yes. That's, that's yeah, great. I would say if even if you can't get in the water, there's just so much information out there now to learn about the ocean. Yeah. And you know, I grew up in, in the Midwest and somehow I convinced my parents that I needed to study marine biology and they had to send me to a coastal school. And it was, you know, it was the pages of National Geographic magazine. And now I'm watching all these um, documentaries with my kids that we didn't have when I was young. There's just so much amazing information out there. And so, right. you know, it, it's all, it's at your fingertips. If you want to do it, you can. And, uh, and learn first, do a lot of science, and, and then take whatever opportunities are available. That's yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Take the opportunities for sure, too. And but also, you know, in this world of social media clips and bits and pieces of information, try to read deeply about the topics you're interested in and think, you know, get, as Amy and Celia are saying, get, um, get experience with them, but, but don't be afraid to read books on your topics or just get, you know, really well read in that, that area because that's going to help you um, a lot succeeding as you go on in science. We read a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we'll agree. All right, Marilyn, we're going to stick with you for a little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the uh, stony coral disease has spread throughout the U.S. Virgin Islands and, and what its impacts have been? Yeah, so it's not great news, <laughs> um, but in the year a little more than a year since we found it. Um, I guess it's been a year and a half now. It has spread entirely around St. Thomas. So it was just li limited to kind of that, that Southwest area for a while. Um, and we have this animation that was made by um, a group here that we're all working together on this disease. And so it spread all the way around the island. Um, by, no by November of 2019, it had hit Puerto Rico to the west and by January of this year, it had hit St. John and this animation only goes till March. And I can say that in the last few weeks, it's unfortunately spread um, past St. John and has hit the British Virgin Islands as I think Amy had mentioned earlier. Um, so the impact of this disease has really been enormous already in just this short year of time. So that original site where we saw the disease at um, the Southwest side at Flat Key um, over a year, we've been monitoring it and it's lost almost half of its coral cover. Uh, and this has included, you know, these, these huge massive corals bigger than a person who that took, you know, almost half a century to a century to grow are being lost within a matter of weeks. So this is another animation um, showing just the loss of living coral tissue on that skeleton and so at the end it's all white and what that white is is that exposed skeleton of the coral so the the living tissue that was colorful that was brown um, that was vibrant when you see it underwater has just basically dissolved off the coral and so as amy mentioned before it it can't recover from that that individual coral is now completely dead and it took a really long time to grow so it's really it's really sad and and as the term coral reef would imply, corals are the foundation of reefs. Um, they are, you know, this is essentially like losing the trees in the rainforest. Um, the health of these coral reefs are not just aesthetically nice, they are also critically important to um, communities that are near them or that they surround. So here in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. Um, coral reefs provide a lot of economic um, development for the territory or, or, or just it helps to drive the economy because, um, because of fisheries that the coral reefs provide, because of the, um, the tourism value that coral reefs provide and just the cultural value too is enormous. 
um, you know, coral reefs protect our shorelines here, but they also are, you know, a major part of the Caribbean culture. So it's been, you know, it's been devastating to see that happen. Well, you just touched on it a little bit, but we have a question here from Evelyn, who's nine, and uh, she asks, besides being home to fish, just what is the function of corals in general? And then a sort of it's a two part question, does the affected coral cause fish to relocate? That's a great question. Um, I wanna give Amy some time, maybe Amy could take the first part, but I can say the second part, we know we're studying some of that and, and there are fish that do um, live on individual corals, probably that fish that harassed Amy on her dive. And we do know that those fish yes, they abandon that home. It's essentially like their house burning down. So they, they leave. And then eventually, you know, a coral skeleton doesn't provide the same structure as a living coral. It's like when a human dies and the tissue goes away, that, that skeleton eventually crumbles to dust and that's what happens to corals too. So um, the first part of the question. <laughs> Was uh, about the function of corals beyond yeah. being home to fish. Yeah, I mean, they are the, the main structure for the reef. Amy, who is a you know, marine micro microbiologist can, can say more about too, just their role in sort of the microbial communities on reef, but uh, on reefs, but they, you know, they're food to certain fish. They are structure for all the organisms on the reef. Um, you know, they're the keystone species. They're the ones that support the reef. I can imagine the fish asking, well, what good are humans anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, turn it around sometimes. <laughs> That's true. All right, before we continue with our conversation, I wanna get in an audience poll. Um, and uh, so we, we wanna test your knowledge about corals. And if you were paying attention, uh, Sylvia sort of hinted at the answer to this a bit earlier. <laughs> Um, let's see if we can get our poll going here. But the question, here it is, is what gives many species of shallow water coral their color? So what is it that makes corals so, so beautiful and have so many colors? And we'll give it a minute here for people to respond. If you don't already know, it might not be what you think. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, people know the answer. Almost everyone got the right answer. And it's tiny algae that live inside the tissue of the coral animals, the polyps. Um, and these algae, they're called, zo am I saying this right? Zo zoantheli, is that? No, so yeah, more or less. What is it? Zoantheli. Yeah. There we go. Uh, they provide the coral with nutrients and the coral provides the algae with protection and a place to live. All right, so. Um, I'm going to go to Sylvia next um, for maybe a little bit of positive uh, <laughs> in all of this. Um, there's evidence that when reefs are protected as safe havens for fish and lobsters and other wildlife, that they're more resilient to pollution, to temperature changes and other pressures. Uh, wh why would that be? Well, just think about yourself. If you're sick, you're more vulnerable. A reef that's sick is more vulnerable. A healthy reef is more robust, able to withstand the temperature changes. And there, there's evidence that healthy reefs, reefs that either are protected or have been miraculously not yet exploited by fishing or other impacts, um, that they, they survive when nearby places do not, or that they are less affected. It's really important to appreciate that coral reef is not just about the coral. It really is a community. Like New York City is not just about the buildings. It's about the infrastructure. It's the taxi drivers. It's the garbage collectors. It's the doctors. It's And coral reefs have, quotes, doctors. They're fish that clean fish. There are there are little shrimp that also pick the parasites off of, of fish. And there is a lot going on that 
people such as Marilyn and Amy are really diving in and getting up close and personal with what, what really affects the corals. I mean, there may have been diseases a hundred years ago, but nobody noticed. But now we're really seeing the, not only witnessing diseases, but we're looking at the causes of them. We know about microbes, we know about viruses. We did not know so much about those things in times past. It's a new world and certainly opportunities for those who are really interested in getting out there and, and solving some of the problems that we see is to, you know, we have new tools, new insights, new ways of, of understanding what's going on. A lot of partnerships that have escaped our notice before now. I mean, I was around when the whole idea of zooxanthellae in corals well, it was a big, big news. Turns out that sponges have associates as well, and bacteria and sometimes partner algae in shallow water, at least in deep water, of course, the partnerships are equally widespread, maybe more so with bacteria and viruses. Not all viruses cause problems. Many of them are absolutely vital to the health of a system, including our own personal health. So it's just, I think the great good news is we now know so much more than we have known in the past. And I think one of the great things that we've learned is the magnitude of what we don't know. Plenty of opportunity for people to, you know, pick up something and make it their own, go for it. Well, that's actually a good segue. I'm gonna to turn to Amy. Um, what are you doing to study and understand uh, this particular disease, stony coral tissue loss disease yourself? Yeah, so, so my lab group, who's not just me, but many dedicated students and postdocs and technicians are, are really trying to understand the role that the microorganisms and particularly bacteria may play in this disease. Um, so we're interested in bacteria because um, in Florida, there's been some really successful cases of application of antibiotics to this disease lesion that actually stops it. And so we think that there may be a role for bacteria in this disease. Um, so my lab's been involved in a couple of different projects um, over the past year. And I'm gonna talk about the most fun project, I guess, that, <laughs> that I think we've, we've put together the most unique project. Um, and it all started with this, this comic. Um, and I was asked to write a kind of a perspective a couple of, or a year and a half or two years ago now about like, what do I kind of see the future of my field and what's to come? And so my kids are always reading comics. And so I worked with this, um, comic artist Natalie Rainier here at Hui, um, and basically we came up with what would it look like if we could diagnose a marine disease in, in just you know a day even, and that you could be out on a reef, you know, see something suspect, take the samples, take it back to your lab, use these um, new fast portable DNA sequencers to tell you something about what's going on with the microbial community, and then relay that information back to the island managers and the other people that can help coordinate a disease response. And then, you know, for scientists, we often spend months like writing papers. It's like the vein of our existence. It just takes, <laughs> it takes forever to get them out. But if you had that data right then, you just like write it on the ship and, and you're off. So this was kind of the dream. Um, and then we were lucky enough to, to get this idea funded to, tr to try to, to put it to, to work, the, the Tiffany, um, and company foundation uh, invested in our plan. And so, so we, we tried this out. And um, so we went down to the Virgin Islands and worked with Marilyn. Um, and so we sampled some of the disease corals, including uh, a recent outbreaks right there. And I think I have a movie of, um, yes, this mm -hmm. is uh, MIT Huey um, PhD student, Cynthia Becker, who's um, sampling um, tissue and water surrounding this disease coral. And uh, so over the course of a couple days, we were able to collect about 120 samples. And we took all that back to our, um, our lab that we made uh, just in an Airbnb rental on St. Thomas. And uh, we basically just miniaturized, you know, brought miniature versions of all the lab equipment we had. And then this new iSeq DNA sequencer. And there's, there's Cynthia. Um, already hard at work on the samples. And so after a week and a half, we had all that data processed when we got back um, 
to, to Woods Hole, we have a hard drive full of data. And so Cynthia has been fast at work uh, during this COVID-19 crisis um, at home, trying to um, understand what's going on. And, and we do have some, some indication of some bacteria that appear to be disease indicator for at least a variety of the species that we sampled. And so it's really exciting. We're now in a, better, in a place that's like, that's much quicker now that we can do this analysis and, and be ready and on with the next steps of understanding how now these bacteria are actually associated with the disease. Neat. Um, I have an audience question here that I want to make sure I don't uh, forget to ask, and it's from Tessa. Um, Sylvia, you're an ocean hero to many of us and to just about everybody watching, but who is your inspiration? <laughs> I think I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> it's, you know, I, some of my mentors were in books, like William Beebe, who inspired me to want to go out and be in a submarine and see what it's like going really deep. Eugenie Clark, who's an expert on sharks, but she loved all marine life and took me under her flipper when I was a teenager and really introduced me to parts of the Florida Keys and, and elsewhere. And, you know, I think my, my heroes really are the kids coming along because when you realize what we did not know, nobody knew, I certainly didn't as a, as a child, that the kids of today grow up knowing what Earth looks like from afar. They have access to these amazing, um, not just books, books are still tried and true, but the, the new imaging that makes it possible to vicariously, not just go to the moon, but to go to the deepest parts of the ocean and to see what we're seeing here in these in these images. Not everybody will get to see even a, a reef that's not in good shape, let alone one that is really in all with all the glorious pieces still there. So, yay. <laughs> um, so, Sylvia, another question for you: Where in the world are corals in good condition today, and and what to what do you attribute their their good health in the face of all these threats? Well, it's taken us some time to wreck the ocean. <laughs> but, you know, we've done a pretty good job just in the last few decades. Part of it is because there are now more people. From when I began exploring the ocean, our population has more than doubled. And that means more appetites, more pressure on all of the natural systems. That, that maintain a planet that works in our favor. So when I first began diving in St. John, where Maryland, near where Maryland has her home in St. Thomas, that was in 1970, when I lived underwater for two weeks as an aquanaut, um, really staying not inside the underwater laboratory, but able to swim out as much as, oh, half a mile away and find our way back home. When the reefs were as healthy as what I'm seeing in the image behind, you know, all of us, we have healthy reefs in our, in our portrayals here. But, um, but I've seen the, the, the change that has taken place. And I um, know that when areas are protected, recovery can occur. And I've been involved in the last 10 years with an organization called Mission Blue, identifying around the world places that are in still good shape, miraculously, that haven't been fished out, that are not yet subject to high levels of pollution, and trying to get individuals to be champions and to inspire communities to work, to embrace those special places wherever they are, and do what they can to keep them healthy or in places where they have been degraded. And I have to say, St. John is not what it used to be, but in the Virgin Islands, there is hope because one of the first protected areas in the, it is in the Virgin Islands going back to the 50s, even before there was a National Marine Sanctuary Program, even before the idea began to catch on. Today, um, around the world, 
I guess it's around 7% of the ocean generally, including some really special coral reefs have been protected in some form, but only 2% fully protected. So National Geographic has a project called Pristine Seas, looking for those areas to find them and try to inspire communities to do what we're doing with Mission Blue. I mean, there, it's all reason for hope because people can see, I'm not the only one who can see, oh, things aren't quite as good as they used to be. In some places they're devastating, but some places are still in good shape. Mostly places where people have proactively done something to give back and, and respecting the importance of fish and lobsters and the other wild creatures that are there as components of what keep the ocean healthy. We'll probably always take life from the ocean as a source of food, but we have scaled up so much so fast that the ocean isn't able to keep up. I mean, again, going back to St. John in the 1970s, yes, people took grouper and people occasionally would take the barracuda and other animals there, but but the pressure was lighter than now, and the, the you didn't export so much. Now you find from the Caribbean, you can go to London and find parrotfish at Harrods. What's with this? Parrotfish are not <laughs> native to, to London. <laughs> so it's the export of wildlife to distant places. It's not feeding local communities as much as it used to. I mean, it's still, there is some of that, that's one thing, but taking large numbers and then using fish for money, that, that really, it's not about you're hungry. It's about you're hungry for the profit you can get from taking ocean wildlife. We have quite a few young people with us who are asking lots of good questions. So I want to get to some of those. Um, Elsie, age 11, asks, what can kids like myself do to help fight this coral crisis? Any suggestions, Amy, Marilyn? Go, Amy. Go, Marilyn. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think just being aware and, and knowing what's going on is, is the first step, and you're already taking that, Elsie. And so thank you for tuning in tonight to learn more about what's happening with our reefs. Uh, the people that are living in these areas that are affected or even the places in the Caribbean that are unaffected um, can keep their eye out for this disease. And so there is a really active citizen science uh, reporting of, of the disease that is really helpful to, to scientists. And, you know, and I think as, as people get older and might have deeper pockets, I mean, we could do more if we had more money, right? And so I'm... I'm don't mean the 11 year olds need to give us their allowance, please hang on to that, you know, make sure you <laughs> save for your education. But, um, but if, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for us to do more. And so that's our really limiting factor for, for at least the science. And and actually, I wanna, yep, go ahead, Marilyn, sorry. Uh, I was just gonna say that, you know, there's a lot you can just do in general to take the pressure off the planet because sometimes a lot of what you do at home, you don't think it's going to affect reefs in the Caribbean, but it does. Climate change is real and it's happening worldwide. And reefs, corals in particular, have been called the, you know, the canaries in the coal mine because when the temperatures increase even a little bit, they're actually kind of fussy and they get really stressed out and, um, and bleach and that can lead to more disease. So anything that you can do to reduce your impact on the earth is going to have a huge impact um, all over the world. So um, reducing your single use plastics, that's like one of the things that, you know, you can easily do to help the reefs because we find plastics on the reefs all the time, microplastics, they make their way to the reefs. Um, mm -hmm. So just doing simple things like that, like making simple choices in your everyday life to reduce your impact on the earth is really important. Marilyn, staying with you for just a minute. I'm sorry, Sylvia, were you gonna say something? Well, just one thing that you should never underestimate kid power. Mm -hmm. Kids have not just power, they have superpower. Grownups can't resist a kid who is earnestly concerned. They might not listen to me, but they would listen to a 
a seven-year-old who said, come on, help. You've got to use, you got to, you have to, you know, take care of the ocean and support the organizations that are really making a difference. And you know, kids sometimes think I'm just a kid. Actually, grown-ups think the same things too. You know, I'm just one. Well, everybody can do something, but kids, when I was the chief scientist at NOAA, a letter from a child got put up on the bulletin board and everybody looked at it and it got answered. Now, some of the other letters that would come in, they would sort of, yeah, we got to thank you, but kid letters really get attention. Don't underestimate your power and go for it. Use that power. <laughs> awesome. Um, so Marilyn, I want to go back to the Caribbean for a little bit. Um, what solutions are being tried to, to combat stony coral tissue loss disease in the U.S. Virgin Islands? And are you yeah. seeing any, any signs of success, I guess? Yeah. So, I mean, in, in this past year and a half, I've been really proud of our response. It's not at all me. I think Amy said that too. You know, it's her lab, but here it's the whole territory is really pitched in to kind of respond to this disease. Um, so one of the things that's been developed with the help of local NGOs, um, volunteers, the local government here and the university is we've organized strike teams. Um, and these, these groups, you know, we got together early on, started meeting. Um, we go out and um, volunteers all over the, all three islands have strike teams now and just look for the disease, you know, documenting where it is, is incredibly important to, to figuring out how to treat it um, and what to do. So um, these strike teams have been on the move trying to document the disease distribution. And then we've been taking um, a lot of advice from Florida researchers and trying to deploy treatments that have been successful there. So we've been um, doing things like applying an antibiotic paste to the corals um, that um, since we think it may be a bacteria that seems to stop some of the lesions. Um, this antibiotic paste is really limited just to the coral, so the antibiotics are not really getting out into the seawater. Um, and they haven't been as effective here as they have been in Florida, so what we've also been doing is um, taking some of the smaller corals that are affected and um, actually taking them out of the water and bringing them back to the University of the Virgin Islands where we have been treating them and putting them, basically taking off the lesion area, that white area, um, treating them as much as we can and, and basically putting them in a, in a spa-like condition. So they're putting these water tables where we filter the water and we're keeping them. We have a, um, a relationship with a local aquarium where, who are offering to host some of these corals and we're just kind of keeping them to, to, and keeping an eye on conditions so that maybe if this disease moves through or conditions change that we can um, put the corals back in the water. And um, corals are really amazing creatures. You know, you can, you can chop off that lesion part of them and then they'll grow back. And so, you know, we have a, an active restoration program at UVI too. So we're just looking for that opportunity. I am on mute. Uh, that actually answered the question that several people have asked about um, tissue culturing and transplanting and whether you can grow tissue in a lab and, and uh, from the unaffected reef to help diseased reefs regrow. And it sounds like the answer is yes. Yes. The, the problem is scaling it up. So we need yeah. more resources to do that. You know, th there's like literally thousands and thousands of corals that are affected by this disease. And so we need to scale up our restoration activities. And you talked about using volunteers. Um, we had a question from Pradeep asking, what is the best way to involve local people in coral or marine conservation? Um, and how can people who live near reefs um, help with conservation efforts? So it sounds like you're, you're doing that in, anyway in the US Virgin Islands. Yeah, we have, um, for the US Virgin Islands, we have a website now that you can go to. It's vicoraldisease.org. And if you're an avid snorkeler or a diver, or you're out on the reef and you see something strange or unhealthy, you can actually report what you saw on that website. 
And then it comes eventually to me and to other um, experts in the territory. And we, if we think, um, you know, it's something that's really concerning, we actually send the strike teams out. And I, and I can honestly say that we did not know that it was on St. John until a report like that came in and we sent a strike team and we found it there. Um, so that's really important. I think, you know, at a, at a global scale, there are definitely organizations that you can get involved with. I'm sure Hui has some, um, but at the University of the Virgin Islands, we, we have, you know, restoration programs that you can get involved with. Um, but I would just recommend going to that vicoraldisease.org site. And continuing along the line of uh, some solutions, potential solutions, Amy, could uh, beneficial bacteria, probiotics, maybe play a role in helping to combat coral diseases? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm, you know, I've mostly been talking tonight about bacteria as pathogens, but they actually play a really important beneficial role to corals as well. And, and not just bacteria, corals are loaded with all kinds of microorganisms, the, the zooxanthellae, um, the algal symbionts, um, as well as bacteria and archaea, uh, fungi and viruses, they all make up the, the microbiome of, of coral. So this is a, an image or an illustration of what that looks like on a healthy reef. These are, these are normal parts of the ecosystem and, and they play an important role in helping keep corals healthy, just like the microbes that are on our bodies and in our guts are just essential for, for our survival and our, and our, our balance. So yes, there's, there's really hope that we can identify certain strains or species of bacteria that are gonna be more advantageous to the coral, um, either to give them that just boost they need to fight the disease or, or actually be um, bacteria that are combating that disease. Bacteria and fungi both produce antibiotics and so they could potentially naturally be doing what humans are, are now doing with these antibiotic pastes on corals. And there's really active research on this idea of coral probiotics by the Smithsonian labs. It's been fun to follow, but uh, it's, a, it's a really, it's a challenging endeavor because there's just so many microbes on corals. Um, they're, they're almost like no other marine animal <laughs> and it's very, very complex and they tend to be very dynamic and even colony to colony will change a lot. And so we're just starting to shed light on what some of these microbes are doing and how they're interacting with corals. And, and so we just need more research to, to really get to a place where we can identify what will be a probiotic. And Amy, staying with you, uh, we've already talked somewhat about uh, restoration efforts, but um, can you can you talk about some other examples of that in the in the Caribbean corals? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, reef restoration can mean a variety of of, of things, really. Um, so whether protecting a reef or or actually trying to to regrow the reef, and I think that's one of the the really exciting ideas. Um, so scientists are thinking really carefully about this now, and it's an active area of, of work in the Caribbean. There's over 40 coral nurseries throughout the Caribbean. And so what they're doing are they're, they're growing these uh, coral fragments um, in a nursery aquaria type habitat, and then they're getting um, outplanted back on the reef. And some of these nurseries are even just underwater nurseries because the corals do quite well, um, especially in offshore water. So reef restoration, replanting these corals back onto the reef provides a mechanism to really regrow the reef framework and help bring back the fish, the other life, as well as the, the services that we as humans depend on from, from reefs. Uh, one of the challenges is that um, typically these outplanted corals don't have a really high rate of survival on the reef. Um, and so that's you know, one of the challenges to overcome. And I think there, there's hope that more research and, and science behind that can help solve that problem. And here at, at HUI, we're in the really early stages of launching a new initiative with a unique vision that brings science and engineering together to try to innovate some of these areas of coral reef study um, that we think we might be able to help with um, so that we're just overall better poised to to develop the framework and the solutions to, to help save reefs. Amy, you mentioned technology and we have a question from Amet, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, 
who says, I'm a robotics teacher and I'm working um, in a prototype of an underwater or on a prototype of an underwater CubeSat. If you had the opportunity to have a small device that could transmit satellite information in real time from the seafloor and the environment around corals, what information would you like to collect? And um, that sort of raises the more general issue of technology and, and how is that playing a role in combating uh, this coral disease? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, especially getting that robot to places that are not easy to dive. So a lot of our observations of, of the corals are in these shallow waters, you know, down to 60 to 80 feet. And we rarely get to the depths that, that Maryland does. Um, Personally, I always want to know about the microbes. <laughs> and so <laughs> if there's ways to take those samples and put my little DNA sequencer on there, I mean, that would be my, uh, my little cartoon um, dream. Um, but, you know, the, we're looking pretty closely at the reef water now, as well as reef sediments. Can those, those are pretty easy to take samples, non-destructive to the reef framework, you know, the microbes in there, the chemicals in there can tell us more what's going on. So, so I think there's a lot of things we could put in your, on your robot. Um, so if you want to send me an email, we could uh, follow up on that. I want to uh, throw in one more question from uh, a younger person, Kaylee, who's 13, um, who says uh, that from the island of Trinidad, um, from the Caribbean, and I'm going to give this to you, Sylvia, because you've talked a lot about how fishing can can hurt coral reefs. Um, Kaylee wants to know: Can too many fish harm the corals? I haven't seen a place where there are too many fish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've seen places where too many people can cause some problems. But what what looks like too many fish is actually normal. But the, the way the ocean once was or in places such as the southern coast of Cuba that's largely been protected now because of politics. It hasn't been fished the way much of the rest of the, not just in the Caribbean, but around the world. Um, it's astonishing. You just, you just can't believe how many fish there are. That's normal. That's normal. We have taken on the order of 90% of the sharks gone. We used to see sharks on every dive, everywhere. Now it's a sign of hope when you do see a shark, but usually you don't at all. They're gone and grouper the same way. Uh, so I think it's really important to get across the concept that, that Carl corals, coral reef systems are just that, they're systems. And by replanting coral, it's a bit like replanting trees in a clear-cut forest. You don't replace the forest by putting the trees back. What you do is give it a jump start, but it takes a long time for the ferns and the mosses and the birds and the squirrels and all of the intricate pieces that make a forest a forest or make a coral reef a coral reef. And we have done so much so fast in terms of extracting the wild creatures out of healthy coral reefs. And I've been a witness to this in the Caribbean, in Florida, and in places literally all over the world where I was privileged years ago in the 1960s to go on research expeditions. Um, yeah, with Woods Hole Oceanographic supported vessels to go to the Indian Ocean and to go to places like Aldabra and the Seychelles when they were really intact. And then to go back and see, where are all the fish? Where are they? What happened? Well, we know what happened. <laughs> we can look in the mirror and figure out what happened. Now, anyway, the, by, by just saying, we're going to take this part of the ocean and give back, just let it alone. We don't know all the answers, but changing the water chemistry matters and fish impact the chemistry of the water. When they munch on seaweeds, they put nutrients back. When fish eat other fish, they put nutrients back. And that is perhaps part of what's happening in these reefs that are obviously vulnerable to diseases. Maybe the water chemistry is, as you've pointed out, 
Amy and, and Marilyn, that may be a good place. But although it's so difficult, there may be subtle little things that make a big difference. But we need to try. We need to look. And unfortunately, we can't sample the ocean the way it was 50 years ago. <laughs> but we can go to those places that are still healthy and find out what makes this place healthy? Who lives here? And, and they're missing over here. Maybe if we put the parrotfish back, maybe if we stop killing the grouper in this area, maybe, just maybe, that's a, a prescription for better health, at least better resistance to the diseases. You mentioned grouper a couple of times, and I know, Marilyn, uh, you have a, a success story that involves a uh, grouper. Can you tell us about that in the, in the U.S. Virgin Islands? Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, you know, a few years ago, well, actually more than a few years ago, almost two decades ago now, um, they established marine protected areas here um, off of St. Thomas with, you know, in conjunction with discussions with um, fishermen and with scientists and the government and they instituted these marine protected areas and they were targeted at certain types of groupers um, and these areas were protecting their spawning aggregations um, and actually now in the last few years we're actually not not only have we seen those grouper species starting to come back but um, the endangered Nassau grouper that was gone from the shallow reefs has started to show up in our transects huh. on shallow reefs. And we think it's because it's taking advantage of these marine protected areas to form their own sort of spawning aggregations. Um, so, you know, these, these protected areas have a lot more benefits than just protecting one species or two species, you know, if they're targeted at a fishery species, um, they have multiple, they have these cascading uh, positive effects. So that was really exciting to see. Um, we've also had some other successful, you know, conservation restoration actions in the territory. Like I mentioned, we have a restoration program. Um, people in the territory, not just the university, but the Nature Conservancy and other groups have been working on coral restoration in the territory. Um, we have a, a program now called VI Reef Response. And that's another way for people to get involved. So if you're a scuba diver, and you're in the Virgin Islands and you wanna join a dive, local dive shops, um, this is Red Hook Divers here, have been hosting um, volunteer divers to go help us uh, clean our coral nurseries that are you know, critical to the restoration efforts in the territory. And you know, we're able to, to plant these corals back out onto reefs where they were, they, where they were lost. Um, and we're seeing you know, some of this reef structure return to those areas. So I want to end tonight uh, on a, a positive note, continuing in the positive vein. So I'd like each of you to say uh, in your own way, uh, what, where do you look for hope and, and what makes you hopeful about the future of corals? And Marilyn, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I'm not just a researcher here at the University of the Virgin Islands. I'm also a professor, so I have the privilege of teaching at the undergraduate level and at the, and advising graduate students. So it's these students, these interactions with these students that have been, you know, the most inspiring. So you've seen some of my photos, some of the photos from um, this presentation were taken by graduate students um, in the program. This photo is of my two recent undergraduate research assistants who've uh, since graduated, one's going on to her PhD. Um, I also helped to lead a program called the Seas Islands Alliance, which is a, a, a coalition of, of groups from different islands, US territories, so Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, and Guam. And this Seas Islands Alliance program, it's funded by the National Science Foundation. We're aiming not just at university students, but middle school students, high school students. And we're trying to create you know, these supportive communities for students from islands who wanna go on to marine science careers. And it's my interactions with these students that gives me hope um, all, at all levels. Just they have great ideas. Um, they are so inspired to pursue you know, a career in marine science and they are hopeful. And you know, when, I get, <laughs> when I get tired of looking at diseased corals, I <laughs> tend to just go <laughs> and talk to my students who usually take the best pictures of diseased corals and they, they are the ones who give me hope. Amy, how about you? How do you see the future for, for corals? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I think the, the future itself is, is a little bit depressing from the science that we currently have. Um, and when I think about that, I, I tend to pull up this, this movie that um, hopefully, yes, is going to play of a, a beautiful reef, a stunning reef in Micronesia, off Nugoro Atoll. And um, while it's not perfect, it's a vibrant ecosystem. And when I'm on reefs like this, the things that I'm thinking about are all the, the, the pieces of this ecosystem that we don't yet understand. There's so many hidden yet critical aspects of this reef, how these organisms are communicating with us to form one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on earth. Chemical communication, sound communication, and the role of microbes are just three areas that are really still black boxes to us. So it's exciting that we now have the technology to dive into these areas and to understand really what their role is in helping create this ecosystem. And I'm also really excited about the upcoming workforce, the, the new scientists that are gonna study reefs um, because everyone out there is just so much more technologically savvy than those of us that are currently in this position. So we need that technology um, to coral reef science. Uh, we need the engineers um, to work out all of these unknowns and these problems. So we have, you know, one of the most diverse representation of our workforce in coral reef science now in terms of race and background and national origin. And we need these diverse and creative perspectives and we need more of it. <laughs> we don't have enough yet. Um, and so I would say if young people are watching today, I, I hope that you will be inspired to help improve the future of coral reefs for us all. All right, and Sylvia, I'm gonna let you have the last word tonight. Well, you know, you could get pretty depressed knowing that globally about half the coral reefs, more or less, are either gone or are in a state of sharp decline. But the good news about half are still in pretty good shape. And while there are projections you can hear people say who are in the business of looking at coral reefs globally that if we keep doing what we're doing there won't be significant numbers of coral reef in another 50 years because this is the trajectory they're really declining cause for hope though this conversation awareness films such as what blue planet 2 getting people to be tuned in and turned on about the little creatures that live there, getting to know their faces, their personalities. They're not just pieces of meat. These are living systems worthy of our affection and of our care and to realize that they're important to us, not just because we can sell them, but because they're intrinsically valuable and because we need a healthy ocean to have healthy people. And I think what really inspires me is the reaction that I've witnessed and I'm deeply into it, but people, once they understand why the ocean matters, they're motivated. They are out there doing exactly what you're, what we've been talking about here. They're, they're taking action. And the kids coming along and the communities who are engaged because they get it, they understand. It's the first step toward being motivated, understanding what the issues are and why it matters back to you. So hope spots, there are now 130 of them around the world. It, and it is cause for hope because people are striving to make things better than they otherwise would be if we just continue doing this. There's really hope that we alive today, in the next 10 years, during this time of the, the global uh, United Nations move, a decade of ocean science, that, that's Woods Hole will be right in the thick of that, of course. And you, I mean, all of us, we are in the thick of it because we're, we're here. The next 10 years could be the most important in the next 10,000 years because of the possible things, the, the positive things that we could actually drive this, this, this trajectory. I mean, I'm enough already with this. We need to go like that. Well, I think that's a great place to end. I hate to end this terrific conversation, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for tonight. Um, 
for those of you who we didn't get to your questions, uh, we will do our best to try to get some of them answered uh, after the event. Um, before anybody signs off, if Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is new to you and you'd like to find out more about us, please stay with us for just a few more minutes. We've got a short film that will introduce you to some of our engineers and scientists and the fascinating work that they're doing. Um, before we show that film, I wanna say a very, very big thank you to Sylvia Earle, Marilyn Brandt and Amy April for sharing your research and experiences with us. Um, it has been a sobering but an inspiring evening and we appreciate your dedication to sustaining coral reefs and the remarkable ecosystems they support. Thank you to all my HUI colleagues who have been working very hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. And to all of you out there, thank you very much for joining us. If you've enjoyed tonight's presentation, please tune in again next week, Wednesday, June 10th at 7.30 for our very final Ocean Encounters virtual event of the season. For our season finale, we'll be talking about oceans beyond Earth, from Earth's deep ocean to the search for extraterrestrial life. Hui marine microbiologist Julie Huber and marine geochemist Chris German will be joined by NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory astrobiologist Kevin Hand, along with special guest comedian Eugene Merman. You may know him as the voice of Gene on the Emmy Award winning animated series, Bob's Burgers. So please join us for that. On behalf of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, thank you again to everyone and enjoy our short film. The oceans, the atmosphere, the interior of the earth, life, everything is connected. We are all linked in our research by our passion for the ocean. Hui is an amazing place full of extraordinary people who are truly curious about the ocean, want to understand how it works. How it interacts with the rest of the planetary systems, how humans influence it. The physics, the geology, the chemistry, the biology, the interaction with human society, it's all connected. What Hui does is it brings all those scientists together. The world's best talent in ocean sciences. We learn from each other. We develop opportunities together. It's a fourth multiplier. It feels like 130,000 scientists. I can pull together a team from either my department or other departments at Hui to really tackle any problem. Having all the support is what makes Hui unique and enables me to do good science. Hui is at the cutting edge of that mix between science and engineering and it allows us to ask questions that most other places can't ask. You can come up with ideas, put them into action and actually deliver results all in a short time frame. Vehicle technology, AUV technology, seafloor instrumentation, sensor development. You get the world-class reputation, but you've also got amazing ships and engineering that allow you access to places that most other scientists can't get to. You can see further, you can go further, you can reduce your risk, and you can do it less expensively. It's really amazing for me to be able to walk out of my lab, cross the street, and get on to the research vessel that can take me anywhere around the world. I've been to remote reefs in the Maldives and the Micronesia. I've dived on both the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the East Pacific Rise, and very few people have actually been down there and seen that. We've looked at these turbulent storms in the ocean and how they create upwellings and nutrients. We're able to collect samples and see how these systems change in real time. Just imagine you are diving, you are reaching the bottom of the sea mount. All of a sudden you see a cloud. As we get closer, we see these objects that were aggregated like in a mass, and you say, what is that? The sense of isolation, you can almost feel the ocean closing over your head as you submerge. You can learn a tremendous amount just by being in the environment. Some things have struck me in the middle of the night. It clicks and you're like, oh my gosh, this is something really huge. It's that aspect of discovery, finding out something new, something that's never been seen before, creates an incredible drive within Huey scientists and engineers and technicians. It's such a compelling place to be so dynamic and so many opportunities that it attracts really smart and dedicated students and young scientists. So I was reading those papers about amazing science that was coming out of Hui. Now that I'm here, I get to actually interact with the people who wrote those papers. The positive feedback and the collaboration finally made me decide, oh, I want to be a scientist. Oh, I can be a scientist. 
it's incumbent on us to perpetuate the cycle of education and research and discovery. People all over the world need to recognize the role that the ocean plays in their daily life, even if they don't live near the coast. It affects weather, it affects food resources, it affects climate. The tides are changing, the temperature is changing, the salinity is changing. Climate change and overfishing are the biggest threats to coral reefs right now. How will the ocean respond to global warming? We have to understand our planet in order to be good stewards of it. We need to get the understanding into the hands of everyone from the general public to people responsible for making policy decisions. It's probably more important now than it ever was. We're very eager to provide answers for those critical questions that we must address now, and we have the tools and the means to provide these answers. This is the best place on the planet to do the sorts of things that we're doing institutions around the world look to HUI as a leader in pushing the envelope. Concepts that were developed here are understood as the basis for oceanography all over the world. I'm proud to be from HUI. There's no place on earth I'd rather be. We have the potential to change the world. It's not just about this planet, it's about life in the broadest possible terms.